So this is an excellent time, I think, for me to blog the um, upcoming Hacker Conference. Um, what does Hacker stand for again? Health and Care Analytics Conference. So that conference will be in the University of Birmingham on the 11th and 12th of July. Um, so we're very much hoping to have lots of NHSR type people there. Um, there will be streams within the conference. So uh, what I'm hoping is that we've got enough kind of open code R, Python, RAP type talks to make their own stream. That would be really nice. Um, so please do um, go on the website and uh, submit the abstract. The closing deadline is uh, upcoming. It's the 27th of March. So do go on and have a look at that. Um, we are currently planning the NHSR conference as well. That's obviously somewhere in the future. Uh, we've, um, I'm not 100% sure we've even finalized the venue, but we've sent a save the date out, which many of you may have already seen. So the save the date was for the, um, the 17th and 18th of October. Um, and we are convening the conference committee, planning committee uh, in a week or two. Um, in particular, I'm interested in the moment to know who people would like to see as keynotes. We've got some ideas of our own, um, but we're always keen to uh, have ideas from the community. It's more than possible we could maybe get a remote presentation if there's speakers, particularly maybe in the US, but anywhere you like, um, that might um, be of interest, then you know, don't rule that out. Um, just suggest them. Um, we will be having a more formal process for um, getting keynotes uh, in due course, but I'm just mentioning that. Just be thinking about the NHSR conference um, and who you'd like to see there because we are going to start having the, the conference committee meeting soon. Um, right, what else can I talk about? So there's some stuff on the blog. There's always been writing loads of interesting stuff on the blog, so do go and have a look at the blog. It's got loads of interesting snippets of code. One of the things we're trying to do at the moment is we're trying to make sure that the stuff that happens on the Slack uh, gets pushed out because not everybody uses Slack. And in fact, some NHS trusts actually block Slack, which um, is very unhelpful. So if you were blocking Slack in your trust, um, can you please stop doing that? Um, so do have a look at the blog. There's always interesting stuff on there. There's a new channel as well in the blog on the Slack, just in case you um, are interested in such things. It's called the Finds channel, and it's just for cool stuff that people have found. And we've started also putting that in the podcast. Um, there was a recent, the first podcast we had quite recently that had the fines on. Um, so do go and have a look at that. So put your own fines in, read the fines, um, and uh, listen to the podcast if you like. Uh, or we always put the stuff from the newscast of the podcast onto the blog as well. So there's lots of ways of finding out what's going on. Um, I'm slightly losing confidence, to be honest, in this whole process because I haven't, I don't know that anything is happening and that I can't see any progress. So I'm starting to wonder if I might just pivot smoothly uh, into something else. And I'm saying this in the hope that one of the people who's working on the technical issues in the background might um, chip in and say either, you know, oh, we're nearly there or no, give up hope or something like that. Um, so we haven't so, had any luck. So um, if you could carry on, that would be really great. Yes, so I'm very sorry, everyone. I think we are, unless, well, let's see. I'm just, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to introduce it. If Filippo appears in the next two minutes, I will very gladly hand the stage to him, but we don't want you to turn out for nothing. Um, so what I'm going to do, I did have a, um, a webinar planned myself, and um, it's one that doesn't require any preparation, so there's absolutely no reason why we can't do it today. Um, oh, there's Q&A. Let me just have a look at the Q&A, what's going on in there. Um, Love it if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Yes, I apologise. To be honest with you, I'm a bit flustered because of obviously the technical issues and I'm not sure I'm doing a brilliant job of this, uh, but I'm doing my best I can. My name is Chris Beely. Um, I am heavily involved in the NHSR community um, and the NHSR conference planning. I'm a data scientist and I work at the strategy unit. Um, right, so as I say, we're going to do something different. If you all think it's rubbish, I won't be offended if you leave, so don't worry, but I don't want you, I don't want you to um, book time out of your diary for nothing. So I'm going to do my April webinar now, which is a bit terrifying because although it doesn't require a lot of prep, I've obviously done no prep at all whatsoever, but let's have a go. So the April, the topic of the April webinar was going to be live coding. So Chris Maney did some live coding for us a little while ago. It's on YouTube if you're interested to see it. Um, and I thought it would be fun to do some live coding. So I'm going to do some live coding of Shiny, which is a big thing that I often uh, talk about. And in particular, I'm going to do some live coding using the Golem package, which is a kind of library within R that helps you build Shiny applications um, in a particular way. So you're doing a great job, thanks, whoever said that. Um, so just to my co-presenters or whoever's in the background, 
I'm going to obviously stop looking at the chat and the questions and everything. So if you want to say anything to me or whatever, can you please just make some noise? I'm very happy um, to answer questions or be interrupted or whatever it might be. But I'm obviously going to be writing code from now on, so I won't have a clue what's going on. I'm going to have my head down. So I'm going to build a Golem application from scratch. Um, if anybody wants to like shout up in the chat like what I should do, uh, they can. But I didn't want to kind of like cheat by having an idea in mind already. Um, so um, please do. That would be fun. I might not do it. If you say something too complicated, to be honest, I might be too frightened. But um, please do chip off if you want to. And so now I'm going to um, get going. Right. So the first thing to do, of course, is open our old friend R Studio, which I will do now. <clears throat> and then I will um, I will then share my screen. So let's just start a, a clean project. Um, oh, I don't really want to. Put, I just want to close the project. No, sorry. Let me just. Uh, I'll see you just being very slow for some reason, but I'll just uh, I'll share my screen in the uh, in the meantime. <clears throat> and here we are. Right, excellent. So, um, the first thing that you're going to need to do is, of course, install the Golan package if you haven't already. And to be honest, I got this laptop actually fairly recently because um, I've changed jobs. So it's more than possible that it's not installed. So let's just make sure that's going in the back and I can talk about it. I'm not sure whether it was or it wasn't. Um, so and I'm certainly going to do the thing that Chris Maney did. Um, I don't know how smoothly I can do it. I will be looking at documentation. When I'm looking at documentation that's interesting, I will show you um, because I think that's an interesting part of it. Um, but just for this bit, just to get started, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to show you every tiny thing I look up because I think that's probably just a waste of time. Um, I'm just trying to remember the command to um, to to open uh, the first. Uh, oh, you know what? I'll figure it out. Never mind. Okay, so go lab. What what could it be? Let's have a look. Must be in here somewhere. Um, <clears throat> Someone in the audience is yelling at me that it's so obvious what it is. Uh, you know, I haven't. Sorry, I'm going to have another quick look. Um, <clears throat> where would it be? Oh yes, of course. Now let's do it. Let's do it the old-fashioned way. Of course, that's a much better idea. So we're going to go to File, New Project, and we're going to uh, just use the wizard, which I wish I thought of before. Start a project in a brand new working directory, and it is just down here. Once you've installed Golem, it will just appear magically here. And this is much easier than what I was messing around with. Um, so let's just call it Demo App because this is just a load of nonsense that I'm making up on the spot. Um, blah blah blah. Don't perform a check on the name because I find that annoying. Um, we're not going to create a Git repository today. I've got enough to think about, frankly. Create project. OK. So here it is. Um, <clears throat> right. So basically, um, just to give a little bit of, a, of an intro. So Golem is a package, and it will allow you it's particularly useful if you want to um structure your shiny package as a, as a normal r package um and the benefits of doing that basically are documenting your functions and writing tests um those are obviously important parts of package development and they're important uh, things in shiny and golem makes it really easy to do that and the second thing that uh, golem is really good for is 
modules. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to, I'm not going to talk about shiny modules today because there's no time to talk about everything. Um, but Golem does strongly encourage you to use modules in your shiny, and I certainly strongly encourage you to do uh, to use modules as well. Um, happy to talk about that any other time, but um, today I think I'm just going to concentrate on showing you Golem because that's what I wanted to do. Um, and so when you click the button I just clicked, you will start off with the script one start dot r. So Golem comes with these scripts actually that make it very easy to kind of build through. So all you need to do is just kind of work your way from top to bottom um, with this script. So and just run each line of code. Um, so the first bit here, as you can see, it, you can give your package a name, you can give it a title, and so on and so on and so on. Um, now I'm not going to laboriously fill all that out now, um, but you can see. In fact, I wonder if I'll. Um, well, just for the just for the sake of argument, I'll just pop a few of my details in. But uh, clearly, I'm not going to do this all now because that would be boring. But in real life, you would. Um, it very helpfully gives a version number as well. Golem is really good at reminding you to and helping you to kind of keep track of version numbers. So all you do is you just put all your stuff in here. And you can put the GitHub repo in here as well, and run it. And then what it will do is it will automatically, and there's lots of auto magic going on with Golem, it will automatically update your description file. So you can see now that it's put who I am, what my email address is, put all the stuff that I just mentioned in here. Um, so that's really helpful. And then all you do is you just keep going down. Um, so uh, this will just um, give you some uh, nice things um, that you can use later on in some of the advanced um, bits of Golem that I don't have time to show you now. Um, this will uh, install some of the recommended dependencies, which is quite useful. <clears throat> there it goes. Would you like to install it? Yes, I would. As I say, this is a new laptop, so there's uh, oh, there's loads of stuff going on. I'm not going to make you sit through all that. Um, so there's a nice thing here. It will um, there's a nice uh, use license um, function. Um, there's the you can use R markdown for the readme if you want to. I don't personally like doing that usually, uh, but you can do that. Um, there's things for to adding a code of conduct. There's things for a lifecycle badge. All these things. Oh, something else to install. Yeah. Um, you can set up Git using this. I usually do this just by hand myself, but it's there if you want to. Um, well, I will set up the recommended test template again. I'm not going to have time to kind of dig into everything that I'm going to show you today. Um, but it's just worth knowing that um, Golem does encourage you to do this and makes it easy to do this. Makes it easy to do the right thing. That's how I that's how I usually talk about it. So there we go. I'm going to use the recommended tests to install yet another package. Off it goes. I like the console. It's this new in our studio. It's all nice and coloured and everything, isn't it? It's, I've not seen this before. It's great. As I say, it's a new laptop. Um, so as you can say, it's made a, it's made a test thing for me here. Um, and uh, it's got the recommended tests and yada yada yada. As I said, I don't have time to go into all today. Um, but if you're into tests, it will just set it all up nicely for you there. You can even um, use it. I never know how you say this. Is it is it fave icon? You can even add one of those little icons that you get on the top of your tab of the um, of the web browser. Um, if you don't, it just gives a nice little uh, Golem logo. Um, and these are to add function files these are more or less useful depending you'll you'll just see how you go um so i've done all the main bits now so all i do now is you just it's so easy run this line of code and it opens the next one so we're done with start now so let's get rid of that we've started uh we might possibly want to go back to it maybe if we update the description or if we add a license later on because you know somebody's decided to let us open it or whatever it might be but on the whole, basically, now this is done. You can forget about it. So let's get rid of it. Right now, this is the kind of um, this is the this is the really important um, bit of the uh, of the uh, thing, and you'll use this regularly throughout the time that you're building your goal. And this is the file that you'll use. Um, this is a really nice. Um, function. What this will do basically is it will trawl your code for um, package dependencies and add them to the description. Um, I'm not going to talk too much in detail about that, but that's what that is. Um, so um, I'll, I'll I'll come back to that. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a module. Um, and I think what I'm going to do, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this in the time. I've no idea, but just so I can write code rather than just rambling. 
I think I'm going to write uh, something because I wrote something a little while ago that does this and it broke, and I, I'm not sure why. I'm going to write an application that rolls lots of dice for you and then reports what the and then gives you a nice little histogram because I do this sometimes when I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons. We like to argue about whether a role is good or bad, and I like to do that scientifically. Um, so I'm going to give the module the name. I'm going to call it Dice Roller. Um, and yes, you can have a test as well. I'm not going to bother with that, I don't think, today because that's a bit overcomplicated, but it's there if you need it. Um, and again, it makes it very easy to do the right thing. So all you need to do is just run this line of code and then it will magically write all this boring boilerplate around the functions for you, not the functions, sorry, you know, around the module for you. Uh, and it will even automatically the open the file for you. So I'm just going to go back and save that. Um, so this is a module, as I say, I'm not going to talk too much about modules because there isn't going to be time. Um, but basically a module is a bit of UI and a bit of Shiny that kind of that, that live together. And the, the main point of using modules is that they're scoped. So what that means is data doesn't leak between one module to the other. So each module can see the things that it can see, and that makes it a lot easier. It means you don't have to worry about giving everything different names or all this sort of thing is that they're all they're all cleaning together. There are lots of advantages to modules, um, uh, but it, it's basically to do with kind of namespacing. That's, that's, that's the essential thing. OK, so I don't want to write loads and loads of code and bore you because I'm supposed to be talking about Golem, but just write, let's write a little tiny bit of code. So let's um, add a, um, a select input. Um, and let's call it uh, dice type. And we're going to uh, give it uh, give it uh, a label like this. And then we're going to give it, uh, we're going to say what the choices are. So choices equals, oops, you know, choices equals, I just turned the rainbow spaces on the other day. I don't know if I love them. I'm, I'm trying them. So I don't know. You can uh, you can draw your own conclusions about that. Um, so let's have a D6, a D8. This is all. This is Dungeons and Dragons jargon. So you might not actually know what I'm talking about, but it's not. It's not super important really. It's more about the. Uh, it's more about R than Dungeons and Dragons. This really. But these are the number of sides that the dice have basically. Um, so let's just have three there. Um, so that will probably do, I think, on the UI side. And then let's write something on the um, on the server side. So we're going to draw. Oh no, sorry, no. Of course, I need to draw a graph down as well, don't I? Um, so um, now, what do I want to? Um, I want quite a simple layout, don't I? So I want fluid row. Column. I'm definitely going to make a lot. I'm just become. I'm becoming aware that I'm going to make a lot of mistakes today. But I guess that's kind of the point of the exercise. I hope it is. If it is, I'm going to do really well. If it's not, I'm going to do terribly. Um. Yeah. So let's have that there. Uh, so that's one column, and then let's have another column. Uh, like this, and let's put a graph in it. So that would be a graph. What? Well, how does it go? Graph output? Is it? No. Output graph. Uh, oh no, it's plot output, isn't it? Of course it is. Been a while, I'm afraid. Right. Um, and of course, I've made my first deliberate mistake, which all the girl and people in the audience are, I'm sure, shouting hoarsely, um, which is that um, when you're using modules, it's very important that you add namespace around the ID. Um, I'm not going to go into too much into why that is. Uh, it's just important that you do it. When you start using modules or Golem, you will always, always, always forget. I promise you that. Um, and it'll, you'll find that very annoying. And I don't think there's even really a particularly good error message when you do it. It just doesn't do anything. Um, so just be very aware. Learn from my fail. You just watch me do it. Um, so yes, that will be the number one thing that you forget to do. Um, Basically, what this function does, you see, is it allows it gets picked up over here. You see, so what it's saying is, let this be part of this namespace, which is, as I mentioned, is the sort of the the, the purpose of the module. Um, so, as I say, you don't have to think too deeply about what it all means. 
um, but just make sure you do it. Otherwise, your application will will fail with, with a, to our recollection, no error message whatsoever. Right, well, so before we write the server code, let's, um, let's run the application. And this is another bit of uh, bit where um, Gala makes it easy for you. So we go in the we go in the is it the dev yeah in the in the dev folder and there's a there's a there's a thing here called run dev. Um, now again, you don't need to think deeply about what all of this does. You can just run the whole thing, and that's what I'm about to do now. And that's the workflow with, with Gala is you write your code and then you just run this whole file. Um, but if you just have a look through it, what you'll see it's doing is it's it's building the package. So it's getting rid of it's getting rid of your um uh it's get, getting rid of the packages that were already there and then bringing them back in again and then documenting it. It does all the packaging stuff clean every time. So you go to this thing, you run all. Um, and yes, it didn't crash. I, I don't think you can probably see that. I'll, I'll when, when there's actually something to show, I'll I'll I'll, I'll share that bit of the screen. Um, but it didn't crash. That was all. I was just checking. I didn't got any brackets in the wrong place. Right. Next bit. Okay. So now we're going to draw uh, the histogram. I don't really like histograms. I'd much rather have a density plot. But I'm in one the way too much stress today to worry about because I always get them wrong many times, and there's no time to watch me fail. Um, so. Um, it's just going to be a plain old histogram today. <clears throat> okay, so um, we're going to um, use the render plot function to draw the graph. And here comes the next bit of um, sort of GoLME um, methodology. And I mean, this is optional, but I very, very, very much favor this, um, which is that all the library. All the all the, the the packages are explicitly called. So what I mean to say is, you use double colon. So you will draw a graph like this. Um, so as I say, this is not. You don't have to do this. Um, but the GLM team certainly uh, encourage you to do so. Um, and I always do as well. So, uh, oh, I need to do some data first, don't I? What am I doing? I'm sorry, I'm under a lot of press because I haven't thought about this, so I'm making mistakes. Um, so we need to roll some dice first, don't we? So um, how are we going to roll the dice? So we need to, um, oh, wait, it does occur to me, actually, these should be named, shouldn't they? So that should be like that. <sighs> <clears throat> uh, like this da, 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 equals twenty. Oh, it's just occurred to me actually. I think the um the input should have shown before actually, shouldn't they? So the fact that they didn't actually means that there might be something wrong. So I'm just going to check that in a minute. Um. <clears throat> Possibly not. Yeah, I don't know what I've done wrong. Anyway, let's let's run it again. So we're going to go back over to run dev. Uh, oh, I've written loads of weird code in the shiny that's going to crash it. Though I have my yes. Okay, so let's just get rid of that. Yes, yeah, so I'm just noticing the UI is not uh, isn't showing at all, and I'm not, to be honest with you, sure why that is. I'm sure I've just forgotten something. So let me just have a quick look. Um, oh, but is it just because I haven't put fluid page in? Will that fix it? <coughs> Quite honestly, I usually copy all this uh, these templates. I probably should have done that this time, really. Just thought I'd remembered it. <clears throat> right. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Fluid row. I think that's OK. Let's try again.
No, that isn't working, and I don't know why, and I'm sure somebody at home does. Uh, but rather than waste your time, um, I will uh, just copy something from the help, because I'm obviously just done something silly that I can't see. Um, so, oh, no, of course. <laughs> yeah. And this is the other thing that you'll do, of course, is that I'm only writing the module, aren't I? I forgot, of course, to add it to the, uh, that's the problem. Sorry. I, I w would have done a bit of preparation before today, I think, uh, if, uh, if, if possible. So I'm forgetting something very crucial. So again, learn from my fail, which is the reason why it's not displaying anything is, of course, because I haven't displayed the module anywhere. So um, let's just have a quick look in the R folder. So as I mentioned, Golem applications are packages. And because they're packages, they have an R folder. And because that R folder is in the package, it will be run at runtime, uh, as those of you who are into package development will know. Um, and you'll see it has all these various things in it. Um, this is the module that I just wrote, obviously. Um, but it has two other crucial elements in it, which I completely forgot about, which, which make it work. Um, so the first one is the server DAR. So this is all the stuff that, that lives outside of a module. So if you've got loads of like big data -y stuff or you know whatever it might be, that's where this goes. This goes everything that is out that is above the layer of modules basically goes in here, and you have to run all of your modules in here as well. So I wasn't doing that, so no wonder it wasn't working. Uh, and again, Golem makes it really, really, really super easy. It just says here literally to be copied in the server. That's how easy it is. And I still forgot. So you just pick that up, and you just plonk it in the server like that. Now, there are lots of clever things you can do in the server with modules, which I don't have time to go into today, but that at its simplest level is how you get them working and how you don't make the mistake that I just made very publicly. And here is something else. And uh, this is goes. So there's the server file, which, of course, would be familiar from those of you who write uh, Shiny applications as they have a server bit. Um, and there's also a UI bit. And I also forgot about this bit. I forgot about them both, which is very silly of me. Um, so. And again, it helps us down there. It says to be copied in the UI, and there's just a nice bit here. So we're just going to pick that up, and we're going to uh, plonk it here. So that will show the module in here. Um, and obviously, there's, you can do lots of clever things in, in, the, in the UI. Um, for today, we're just going to have a UI with one module on it. Um, but of course, what you can do is you can write quite a large complicated UI with lots of sections and put a module in each one of those sections. Um, the shame I don't have time to put two, uh, two, two modules together, but there isn't time for that today, but you get the idea. So let's just save that all together. And now I think we're going to find that it works, or I certainly hope that we are. Otherwise, I've got problems because I've already been talking for half an hour. <coughs> Yeah, so it seems to have loaded but crashed, but that's maybe just because I'm messing around with uh, in the in the in the um, in the server thing. So I'm not too worried about that. So I'll I'll show this one. It's working. I'll 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 show we got two so far. I think it probably just doesn't like the fact that I've got an empty function down here. <coughs> right. In fact, before we go any further, let's just make sure that's what it is, rather than telling myself stories. There it is, beautiful. Yeah. Well, let's um, let let's show where we are. So, it's going to stop sharing, and I'm just going to show. So, so far we built two column application. There's a thing down one side uh, where you can select which dice you want to roll, as you can see. So we're all good so far. All right. Where's Teams gone? All right. I'm going to stop sharing that, and I'm going to start sharing. Um. Something else. I'm resisting the urge to read the comments because they're just going to completely throw me. Um, okay, cool. So we're working so far. So let's keep going. So now, so we've written the. This is the UI bit of the module, and each module has got a UI bit and a server bit. So the server can obviously now, in the standard shiny way, uh, do stuff with the um, with the stuff that's in the UI. So let's roll some dice. Uh, so let's see what we're going to do. So we're going to uh, maybe have, um, well, let's make a data frame because we're going to draw it with ggplot2. 
So let's say df gets uh, data.frame uh, and we're going to write uh, maybe roles equals and then we're going to do um, sample of one to uh, input dollar sign dice type. I think this is right. To be honest, I do make a lot of mistakes when I'm writing Shiny, so um, I'm sure I'm sure everybody does. I'm sure this is not some horrible secret that I'm giving away. Um, but I think that will be right. And then we're going to do the number of roles that we're going to do. So let's do plenty because it's a computer, so we can do loads. And let's um, we obviously need to set replace equals true, otherwise it will run out of dice rolls. Replace equals true. There we go. Gone over the eight characters, which is a sackable offence in my team. Um, <clears throat> right, I think that's right. Now we're going to draw a graph. So I always draw histograms wrong as well. So I think I want um, DF. Oh, hang on, no, I don't want it there, do I? No, hang on. Right, DF pipe. Oh, it's not. It's it. No, I want the base pipe. That shows how new this computer is. I'm sure I wasn't doing the base pipe earlier, was I? I don't know. Anyway, um, right, DS pipe, and then we want uh, rolls, and then we want plus. And I always get this wrong as well. So again, we need to uh, we need to add the. Um, uh, have I written that right? GG plot get two, um, geom underscore histogram. I think that's right. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do the thing that I always tell everybody to do on my shiny training, which I'm not doing it now, which is I'm going to test that code outside of a um, outside of a reactive context. <clears throat> I've said that hundreds of times, and I'm not doing it publicly, which is not good. So let's let's do it properly. So um, yeah, so that should produce that, and then this should draw a nice graph. Yes, there it is. Um, <clears throat> oh, it just occurred to me. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not quite doing this right, am I? Because actually, I want to roll multiple dice, really, don't I? Um, yeah, I'm not going to bore you all with faffing around with that. Um, the one I roll was would be like you'd roll like five dice, because that's obviously because obviously you're going to have the same number of reaches. Not not super interesting. Um, but I don't have a huge amount of time to faff around with that, so I'm not going to waste people's time with that. So. Just going to push on, um, but um, yes, that's what I would normally do. So I think this should work in a reactive context. Uh, it does seem to want a bracket. Oh, of course, yeah, I've forgotten the curly brackets. Goodness me, I'm making a lot of mistakes. And then this is goes here like that. Right, I think it's much happier now. So hopefully, this will. Um, This will work, um, and once I've got it working, and I'm going to talk you through some of the extra features, and then I think we're probably about done, uh, and I'll wrap up with time for questions. So uh, back to run dev and run the application. I seem to have gone to the wrong port number for some reason. I don't know why that is. It's very strange. Right, so just unshare again and share. And here it is. So it works. As you can see, I have somehow managed to um, put them in the same row, which I didn't mean to do at all. Um, so I might just quickly correct that. Um, but it does at least work, which is nice. Um, so let's go back to the R, which is here. So what have I done wrong? Why is it? Um, 
Oh, I've just written them both in the same column. Yes, I have. There's a bracket problem there. So there should be a bracket here uh, to close off that column. Yeah, like that. Yeah, I must say, I'm getting some very strange, um, I don't know if it's my laptop, but it might just be worth mentioning just in case anyone else has, has this problem, is that um, it's saying listen here, and it's launching a browser for me, but it's launching a browser that's pointing to the wrong thing. So I'm having to then copy and paste that into the thing. So that's a bit strange. Um, <clears throat> so I think probably the best thing to do is probably just, I don't really want a random port anyway. So I think maybe if I comment that out, maybe that problem will go away. Um, but yes, so I think that's probably enough coding for now. I'm just going to show you the final application. This is as much as I can achieve in 30 minutes. So draw your own conclusions. Um, here it is. As I say, if it would roll multiple dice, this is actually pretty useful for Dungeons and Dragons arguments, but it only does one because I'm a bit flustered and I've got time to rewrite it. So it's actually not that useful. Um, but here it is. Right. So now that's all the programming I've got time for. Let me just show you some of the other bits and pieces now that are important to understand. Um, so the first thing that we haven't um, we haven't looked at properly is um, the dependencies. So as I mentioned, um, our Golem packages, Golem applications, sorry, are packages. And that's really awesome because they will automatically handle dependencies. Um, so for those of you who have been given someone else's Shiny application, if it's not written in Golem, there's always this awkward bit where they have to um, kind of laboriously either explain to you or write lots of code or you get those, you know, if not installed, installed, you get all that kind of stuff. And it's not, it's a rather inelegant way of handling um, package dependencies. Um, so go on to the rescue. So as I mentioned, they do encourage you to um, namespace your uh, package. I am sharing. Am I sharing? I am on time. No, I'm not. No, sorry. They do encourage you to namespace the package course that you do, like with ggplot here. Um, obviously, this is very simple. I would have used loads and loads and loads of packages over here. It's a bit more complicated. Um, so, and it runs because, of course, because because I've got those packages installed. But if you gave it to someone else and they didn't have those packages installed, it wouldn't run. Um, so, what you need to do in that case is you need to go to uh, back to dev. And as I say, this is the file that you'll most commonly work with. You'll be going back and to and from this, adding. Um, adding modules. Um, there's some other bits and pieces as well that I'm going to do in a wrap up at the end where I talk about some of the other things that it does. Um, so all we need to do is just need to run this line here at the top. Um, and what it does is it will it will it basically reads all your code. It finds things like this and it will add them to the description. And it's all done automatically. So as I mentioned, um, yeah, so I've used ggplot2 and so now it's in ggplot2. So if you're like me and you like to explicitly call your pa all your packages and you don't like to explicitly faff around writing description files, this is absolutely marvelous. I mean, this function is not a, not a part of Golem. That's the other thing about Golem. Actually, it brings lots of other things together. You'll see lots of these functions are not Golem functions, but it brings them all together in a nice, easy place and it, it brings some consistency and you can just run them all. So it's really, I mean, I learned package development by learning Golem. So it's just, it's a nice, smooth workflow where it's saying, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And the idea is that you, it's an opinionated way of, of doing stuff and it makes stuff easier. Um, so, um, so that's worth knowing. And as I say, the fact that this is packaged with the dependencies managed is really cool because it means that, um, you can run shine applications anywhere and you don't have to explain to people how to install all the packages. Um, let me just show you a couple of other things on the dev thing uh, and then I'll say a few more things and I'll wrap up uh, for questions. Um, so there's some really nice stuff here um, for adding bits of uh, for your own JavaScript and for your own CSS. I did a talk actually last year about um, using um, JavaScript and whatnot. Um, and quite, I mean, this is again, like there's no, there's not rocket science, but to be quite honest, I never really know where those files go. I get really confused. Um, so it's just that you just, you, you press it. Well, let's do it now. It won't do any harm. So you run it 
and it says there you go and it appears and you don't even have to know where this is it'll just it works it's in the right place um so it really you know it reduces the amount of brain power you need to to exert on this uh, considerably um there's several use this functions so there's one that encourages you to have uh, a separate um raw data folder which i think is really 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 useful um often projects that i see have lots of data kind of laid all over the place and it's all a bit messy um this encourages that discipline um and another what really really important one is uh tests so you can run this for everything that you do and obviously the, the work the golem workflow does encourage you to write tests for for everything that you're doing so you can just run this and again it will just automatically make you uh, a, a code file in the right place and you can just write your test uh, and off you go and it's all it's all um kept to where it should be in here right i think that's the main stuff i want to say about the dev folder as i say there is other stuff in there so do have a look through um those are the main useful bits i think that i use kind of day to day um and then it's even so nice so 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 logical is that when you get to the bottom of the dev file it even has a thing that says navigate to file deploy so this is the other bit where golem really comes in handy is it's it's agnostic to how you deploy it so we'll just run that and it just magically pops up um and this will um this will deploy your applications it will do lots of useful things depending on where you want to deploy it um so as you can see there are some checks here there's a check for cran and there's a there's a common garden check um you can build it locally um as a, a sort of package archive thing of me um they have special functions for um deploying to different places so there's one for our studio connect which is what we use in my team there's another one for shinyops.io and there's another one for um shiny server um i'm pretty sure the pro version of that has been has it been completely dismantled or deprecated or whatever but there's still the open source version of it so um that will help you with that um and um yeah there's some other things that are a bit bit more complicated than I haven't tried like things on with docker um and all that sort of thing right I think I've said everything I want to say let me just very quickly just look at the um at the structure of it just to make sure that I haven't forgotten anything um no I'm going to stop programming now and just unshare my screen I'm just going to finish with a couple of closing thoughts and then I will take questions um yeah, so I hope that was a useful tour of Golem. I'm sorry that I'd spent literally no time thinking about it at all, uh, but I wanted to fill in something for those of you who um, who had come out today. Um, so as I say, Golem is really, really useful because it will manage dependencies for you, it helps write tests, and it makes lots of fiddly things like deploying to RS Connect or finding where the JavaScript should go or all those kind of things really, really easy. The thing that I haven't really had time to, to cover today and is really important is it also encourages you to write separate functions so a big part of the book that they wrote which goes with this application called engineering production grade shiny apps encourages you not to write any business logic in the shiny code which i've done today for time but instead you should write a rolling dice function that sits outside that sits in a separate script in the r folder and that function is then called by the by the reactive logic so you have a very clean separation of shiny functions on the one hand which do all the reactivity and handle the you know the way that the application talks to itself and interacts with the user and all that kind of thing and then on the other side a totally separate clean set of functions that don't have any reactive um inputs into them at all that just do the stuff that you do uh, you know in my case rolling a dice but in other cases it would be you know uh pulling from a database or running a test or drawing a graph or whatever it might be so i hope that's a useful intro to golem uh do find me around on the slack or on mastodon or wherever if you've got any more questions and i'd be very happy to take some questions now too do you want me to read them out for you and i've just oh sorry because i was supposed to be hosting well yeah <laughs> so i can host for you now even though i was a bit late well do so, you mind because uh, my no. brain's been off the hook no, so that's you fine. please host though thank yeah, you yeah so you've got some good questions in one of them was about shiny but I suppose it could affect uh, Golem as well. Um, struggling with the placement of things with graphs and inputs, especially the 12 column layout. Not sure. Um, well, just like I, I don't know whether that also affects Golem in the same way as it does with Shiny. And I remember you 
showing me like getting the the columns right and like six and six it always has to add up to 12 and I wonder if that's the issue that this person was having or has experienced does that make sense um, yeah it does make sense yeah I, I mean I don't know what the specific problem is yeah if the columns or I mean obviously I messed it up at the beginning because I got a um, bracket in the wrong place all the columns need to add up to 12 uh, that's not a shiny thing that's a bootstrap thing that's like a web framework that, that decided that um, I mean yeah I don't know if they want to show me if you just want to just strip everything out of it and just show me the actual you know the code that draws the thing I'll be very happy to look at it but yeah that should that should work a fluid row with two column well two or, or more columns nested inside it with widths that add up to 12 um, that yeah that should that should work okay and the other question um if you need the UI for all of your server functions, does that mean that you can't really break it into modules? For example, with drop downs that affect all of the charts, um, these will need to be in the same module possibly, and therefore could end up could end up with a normal app. I'm not sure what that meant. Oh necessarily. yeah, no, 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 I know what you mean. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. So the thing about Golem is it kind of just enforces that kind of discipline. Um, so what you would do in that case, because I very often write Golem applications that have uh, inputs that affect everything is you would you would you you have to you have to pass that input yourself so you can so each module can see its own stuff you know that's namespace so it can see its own stuff and it might be called whatever input dot you know input date whatever um but that there's nothing to stop you from taking something outside of the module and just passing it deliberately and it's one of the arguments in the server i don't have time to go into the detail now but each server module you can show it whatever you like you can show it data you can show it reactive objects you can show it input you can show it anything you like um but you have to make that decision and that's one of the things i like about Golem is instead of having every input be everywhere all the time you have to think oh well this is you know this date this is really you know it might be date for example date of the data that's a classic one it affects everything so you you will tell each module oh this is what the date is um but the point the thing that i like about it is you'll make you're making that deliberate decision Whereas another module might have its own thing about date that's completely separate and you don't have to have to kind of worry about like, oh, what's it called and where is it? You're deliberately feeding these things through. That might also tie into a question that's just come in about you mentioning using functions. Do you have to use functions even if there aren't any variables within the function? Well, yeah, this is this is the perennial question, isn't it? When to, when to write a function? Um, so. I mean, I do think Shiny, you know, Shiny is quite interesting, really. I've always, I've been doing Shiny for a long time, and I think it throws up a lot of kind of quirky questions like this one. So we have this thing, dry, don't repeat yourself. Um, and, but they do argue in engineering uh, production grade Shiny applications, um, uh, which I probably should, I've, I've shared a link. Chat, can I? Oh, you have. Oh, no, I've shared it. Yeah, I found it. It's yeah. engineering-shiny.org for the purposes of the uh, the video. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, in there they say, you know, even if you're not reusing things, and all modules is another one. You know, module is is another example of this, where because you can reuse modules. That's one of the nice things about them. So if you do the same thing repetitively, which you do sometimes, you have a shiny, you have a bit of shiny that, that in several places that does the same thing. You can actually reuse the module, which is really neat. But even if you're not reusing the function, even if you're not reusing the module, certainly this book, and I agree with the book, I mean, it's not my opinion, it's theirs, encourages you to write modules and write functions because they are clean and well documented. That's why it puts them, it's kind of partly about legibility. It puts them somewhere where they can be seen and understood and tested and built on and all this kind of thing. Whereas compare that to, and I say this often and I apologize because I'm not criticizing anyone's code because I've done this hundreds of times myself. So it's not a bad thing. It's just we all do it. These massively long shiny applications, like two and a half thousand lines of shiny, and they've just got loads of stuff in them, loads of functions and this and that and everything. And it's fine. It runs and, you know, you can write it. And I've written many of them. But coming back to it a year later and certainly handing it over to someone else, it is intimidatingly complex. Whereas if it's all factored out neatly, this is all the functions related to this module. This is all, this is the, you know, all it, boom, 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 boom. It's really easy to understand. And it also means you can change that function very easily and not worry like, oh, actually, well, hang on. It's written here, but maybe they're doing something slightly different over here that's, and they should be together and they're not, you know, all that kind of thing. So, um, 
as much as possible without, you know, writing. Well, yeah, no, I'm going to say you, you should do it for everything. I can't think maybe there are some edge cases, but in my opinion, I think you would always write functions. There's, there's no reason not to. Really. Well, I've even um, seen from our colleague, Tom Jemmett, he uses functions even just to create a dummy data set, which I've never even thought of. So he, you, he literally uses functions all the time for stuff that I wouldn't have even considered. So I, I think maybe it is that thing that you start simple and do try to do functions because they can seem scary. But as you say, try and use them all the time because you may use them repeatedly or you get into the habit of using them. It just makes it a bit easier until you get to that really complicated one and then it won't be so scary when you get there. And they're documented uh, as well. I don't know if I've oh, said documented. that already, yep. but functions are documented and that's really, really, really important. Oh yeah, yeah. It gives you an explanation of what, what you're doing in that area. And there's another question which might be a debugging thing that we need to do though. Um, running the Shiny app, the R pop-up is blank, but the browser shows the app so not sure what that would be i Is don't know that's a good question i wish i did i would seem clever if i did don't trust that pop-up thing honestly oh, I, I almost wish it wasn't there to be honest because oh. i think sometimes you're looking at it like oh what's going on and then you go oh hang on and you click one and it's fine i think there must be i don't know i think there must be some web things that it can't do there it can do the basics oh. but there are things that it can't do so don't yes. don't ever don't i never use it i don't trust it so on the cloud, when I've used things that are built into our studio that use Shiny, um, it usually gets blocked because of the VPN. But recently when I've been using it and I'm not blocked on the VPN, it's asked for a mini UI update. And I wonder if that's being forced on the cloud, but isn't available to everybody depending on their computer. So I suppose what we're kind of concluding here is always try and open it in the browser. <laughs> Don't you could even set it in the options, shiny, well, I can't remember it is, oh, options shiny.launch browser equals true or something. I've set it on all my computers and then forgotten what it is because you only have to set it once. Um, yeah, don't trust it. That's my advice. I, I don't like it. I kind of wish it wasn't there, quite honestly. Oh, right. That's interesting. And oh, there's another question came in. Sorry, I missed this one. What's the difference between a module and a function? What's the difference between a module and a function? Sounds like a joke, doesn't it? What's the difference between a module and a function? About 10 minutes. They walked into a bar. <laughs> Ordered a drink. Um, what's the difference between a module and a function? Uh, I don't think I can answer that question in a technical way, I don't think, to be honest, because I don't understand the, the, the background of it well enough. Um, a, a module is, is, a, is a set of reactive things. That, that's the difference. So a module, I think the, the key difference really is that a module has got UI to it. So a module has got buttons to press and reactivity and dependencies to manage and you know that's the point of a module is it's reactive and it's got a framework and a whatever uh, whereas a function is just a thing where you ask it a question and it tells you the answer um but they the, but the reason why i'm talking about in the same breath is because they're very similar from a shiny point of view they are both reusable components that you can uh you can kind of and also they, they have namespacing so you can take a, a set of disparate elements and namespace them, put them inside something and then forget about them. And that's true with modules in terms of having a whole module that does whatever it might be, rolls a dice and shows a graph. And it's true of a function in terms of having a function that does one thing, which in terms of which is go and get a database and find the most in recent year and run a time series analysis on it. Um, so and in fact, that's what these if you look at the history of modules, that's what our, our studio posit, sorry, say is that before they invented modules, they used to say, oh, just write functions. Um, but what they realized was that there's a sort of hard limit to that because a function can only ever be a function. It can't kind of live with a set of other functions. So modules are where kind of like, you know, making these things kind of cohere together. So this may be a, a silly question and it's my own, so I can take ownership of this. Can you have more than one function in a module then or is it one to one relationship between them? One function in a module. Have I understood that correctly even? Oh, yeah, no. Well, I mean, a module modules can be very, very large and complicated. So modules, I mean, you right. wouldn't, you shouldn't define a function in a module though. Right. Oh, I see. I it gets I called in it. So these get, they're separate. I can't think of a time when it would be, I always would think you should never say never, should you? Maybe there might be a good idea occasionally, but I, I can't think of one. Um, but yeah, you would define your function in the R folder separately. Um, and then the module will call on that function because it's cleaner rather than bundling everything together. 
So somebody's um, posted some information about namespaces because I suppose this may be quite new language as well. I mean, I'm familiar with it in terms of packages, not certain, certainly not with Golem and um, Shiny. And so namespaces are used to organize code into logical groups and to prevent name collisions so that it can occur, especially when your code base includes multiple libraries. So is that so the namespaces, everything is declared and listed. The classic really is with tidyverse, isn't it? And there's a clash between the filter function and in terms of packages and the stats package because they yeah, use the so same name. Modules, but they're different. Modules and functions both have namespacing. So if you use DF in a function, right. it doesn't affect all the other DFs in the package. That's kind of part of the point of functions is you can write DF and X and I and J and not worry that someone else, another bit is using it. And a module is the same. You can write import dollar sign date in a module without worrying you know, it's nice in the, if it's collaborative. If there's more than one person writing shiny code, import dollar sign date is quite an obvious import. So you might worry and think, well, if someone else has written import dollar sign date anywhere in this application, it's going to break because now we've got two things called import dollar sign date. But modules don't have that problem. Oh, only that module knows about import dollar sign date. All the other modules are completely oblivious. So you can replicate all of the names in each module. It's, it's not a problem. That's useful to know. That's it for the questions. And we've got a couple of minutes left before we wrap up officially. So I'm going to say thank you for stepping in at the last minute with our technical issues that we've had. Um, I don't know if you had anything more that you wanted to say before we end the session. No, I feel I should have some some patter, shouldn't I, about um, join the Slack and here's Twitter <laughs> and everything. But I'm so flustered that I haven't. So I'm very sorry. Right, OK, so. Check out the website for information. We're I'm I'm trying to learn how to do the website and get the information out. Oh, somebody's put a question in while I'm I'm wittering away. What's the best way to document a function? Just don't Aaron worry though, you keep going. I'll um You'll do the question. Um so oh, check that. out the website. They've got lots of links there to all the different things that we've got where this will be published as well through the YouTube, so you can get through that through the website. We've announced the dates. Uh, as a holding for the NHSR conference this year, which will be in October. It will be hybrid, so that will be um, in person as well in Birmingham, but details are to come. And we're still doing podcasts, or Chris is doing podcasts, and we're doing lots of things. And most of the stuff that we talk about and share and catch up, and please do come onto the Slack group to resolve some of the issues that people have faced. And that has taken us up to the hour, so we can now nicely finish uh, an impromptu tour of Golem Shiny used by Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming and staying with us. And the questions are great. Okay, bye-bye. Okay.